Hey everybody, uh, we're going to continue our discussion about chapter 6, and um, quick review of where we were, I guess. Uh, we were on number 4, nucleophilic substitution kinetics, so the main uh, reaction we're talking about right now is, is the uh, SN2 reaction, right? And we talked about that last time. Kinetics refers to the rate of the reaction. Okay. So uh, and we we talked we showed this example last time, uh, methan uh, hydroxide attacking chloromethane to make methanol and uh, chloride ion. It's a nice SN2 reaction. We talked about the you know how we you determine the rate. You can kind of either monitor consumption of the starting materials. Uh, the technique we typically use is gas chromatography. That's um, really a, a technique. Um, discussion and we're not going to get into it, but it's it's a method you can kind of monitor organic molecules and the, you know how much of an organic molecule you have, um, and uh, you can also monitor the formation of products. You can either monitor the consumption of starting materials or that you can monitor the formation of products and kind of those are easy things to do with something like gas chromatography. Uh, and what we found was that the the uh, rate of the of this reaction depends on both starting materials, the uh, substrate, chloromethane, and hydroxide. So if you double that, you double the rate. If you double that, you double the rate, etc. And the units are moles per liter per second. So it's uh, um, concentration per time, right? Okay. So the rate depends on both starting materials and and both reagents. The substrate and the nucleophile are involved in a single step. That's kind of what we concluded last time, All right? And then what we also did, we we sort of uh, concluded by saying that the mechanism is called bimolecular, bimolecular, and and because it depends on two reagents, and and uh, and the rate depends on two. Reagents. The mechanism and the rate depend on two reagents, and we call that an SN2 reaction. Uh, S means substitution, which is the type of reaction we're doing. N is nucleophilic. Nucleophilic. Two is bimolecular. Substitution, nucleophilic, bimolecular. Okay, that's kind of where we left off. Now, uh, I, I just want to contrast that. This is just a little bit that I, I wanted to talk about last time, but I didn't. That I have time. I want to contrast that with a unimolecular reaction, and this is what we're going to kind of talk about in chapter seven, where the rate depends on one reagent, and that's going to be called the SN1 reaction. The SN1 reaction is, uh, and the SN1 mechanism will be something that depends on one reagent. Okay, so it's not going to depend on the nucleophile. It's just going to depend on the substrate. That's a preview of next chapter. All right. Um, and so this this is just an example of that. And this we'll we'll get back to you next chapter. But like, if you have a tertiary substrate, if you have a tertiary substrate, um, then you start having these kind of unimolecular reactions. We'll see why it's special for tertiary substrates. But iodide reacts with a tertiary bromide, and then it gives the tertiary iodide and bromide. It's a different mechanism. It is not SN2. It's actually going to be this SN1 reaction. That's the next chapter. Okay, so we're still in number four, which is nucleophilic substitution. And kinetics. Um, and we're going to talk about a little, a little bit more about the mechanism now. So we're continuing. And um, and knowing that it's a bimolecular reaction, meaning that it, the mechanism involves the um, substrate and the nucleophile in the uh, in the rate limiting step. The mechanism of the SN2 reaction is called concerted. 
and you'll see that it involves both the substrate and the nucleophile in the same step. And a concert, what does concerted mean? Concerted means one step. So meaning both, uh, everything happens in one step. That's what concerted means. Everything, the mechanism is a one step reaction. Okay. And uh, we already showed the mechanism. Let's show it in a little bit more detail though now. Um, and kind of like a three-dimensional depiction of how this mechanism works. Okay. The mechanism is that the nucleophile, we're using the same example that we did last time, which was hydroxide reacting with chloromethane. But now I'm going to kind of show the th three-dimensionality of the other stuff. The hydrogen, the hydrogen, and the hydrogen. Okay, so this is a nice tetrahedral depiction of chloromethane, right? Remember when we, when we draw, like to draw things tetrahedrally, I usually draw like a, the central carbon or whatever, and then the two things that are, two of the things are going to be uh, sort of cl close to each other and have lines to them, so they're in the plane of the paper. The other two things, one's dashed and one was wedged. Also remember that um, this is not implying something about like the this H is being left and this is to the right. This is actually going straight back and this is going straight forward. And in reality, this is... Um, kind of like covered up by this one, but we, we just draw it this way, okay? All right, so in the mechanism, in the mechanism, I'm gonna circle the lone pair, which I, is something I like to do. This attacks here, right? Okay, we saw that, and of course we know that the chloride is gonna go away, but what does the, um, what does the transition state look like? Because every reaction is a transition state, right? So. The transition state, of course, is the is like a high energy intermediate, a high energy intermediate between like the starting material and the the product, right? And that we have not talked about yet. So, and we use a little double double dagger is the symbol we use to indicate the transition state. Okay. So, what what do you think it might look like? I'll, let's draw the product first. So in the pro, and you know what, what is the product? Oh, the hydroxide kicks this, attacks the carbon, kicks off the chloride. Well, then the product is methanol, and inter interestingly, it kind of looks like it flopped from one side to the other. Like the hydroxide attacked, kicked off the chloride, and, f and everything flopped. All the hydrogens flopped from one side to the other. Okay, so what do you think the transition states can look like? It's going to be the, the high energy intermediate between starting material and product. Well, it's, it kind of looks like the intermediate point, as you might expect. You have the hydrogen here. And then you have a, kind of like a half bond to chlorine and a half bond to hydroxide. Okay. And right, and and like over here, this has a full charge. Hydroxide has a full charge. And oh yeah, what's the, what's the other thing I'm missing on the right? Cl minus, right? And then we have Cl minus over here. So these are not. Where, where's the charge? Charges here, right? If this is negative plus neutral, and this is neutral plus negative. That's a chloride over there, right? And then where is this thing uh, just neutral? That wouldn't make sense because this is like a net negative thing and this is a net negative thing if you consider the chloride. So this can't be neutral. This actually has to be kind of net negative and the way I draw that is I say delta negative, delta negative. And then this is kind of delta positive. Uh, and so there's a kind of the, the overall thing is is net net negative. 
Uh, so actually, I'm going to get rid of the delta positive. I don't, I don't think it's actually delta positive. I think it's just kind of two delta negatives equal like one full negative. Yeah, that's that's actually more correct. Okay. All right. So anyway, the 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 as the hydroxide attacks and kicks off the chloride, you have this sort of planar tetra planar uh, uh, intermediate planar carbon is planar. That's weird, right? We're not used to seeing. Uh, carbon, for one, with five bonds to it, that's weird. That would kind of violate the octet rule, right? Um, and also have this, well, you do see this in sp2, but the big thing is the, the ele electronics of this is kind of weird, and it, it, transition states are often kind of weird, so this isn't that weird. Okay, um, yeah, cool. All right, so uh, you might say it's uh, semi-pentavalent. It looks like we have five bonds to carbon. Is that ever cool to have five bonds to carbon? It's never cool to have five bonds to carbon. But the thing is, these are partial bonds. It's kind of like a half bond and a half bond. So overall, if you consider the half bond and half bond, it is kind of like there are four bonds to carbon. Okay, not five. All right. So um, the like I said, the reaction is concerted. Um, and by that, I mean, in this instance, the bond making and breaking steps are simultaneous. The bond making and breaking steps are simultaneous, okay? Um, yeah, and you can see that kind of like in the transition state, this bond's kind of being made and this bond's kind of been being broken all simultaneously. That's what we mean by concerted. Okay. Uh, the other interesting thing about this, if you look at the how the nucleophile attacks the carbon, it, it sort of attacks from the back side relative to the chloride, and we do, we we say that we say the nucleophile nuke displaces the leaving group, the thing that's leaving, from the back side. Okay. And if we're considering the angle that is attacking, if we consider the angle where the hydroxide is attacking relative to the chloride, what is the angle? It looks like if it's from the back, that would be 180 degrees, right? So I'll say that too. Approaches 180 degrees from the leaving group. Okay. All right. As a little side note, you, you know, when you think about the bonding of this thing, the bonding, because you know, that's a sigma bond, right? It's kind of like you have a sigma bond to the chlorine. This is going back to molecular orbital theory a little bit, but if you have, if you envision kind of like this is a sigma bond, right? What is in the back of a sigma bond? It's something called a sigma star. What was the sigma star? It was the antibonding orbital. So when this attacks, it's actually attacking the antibonding orbital, and that causes the breaking of the bond. I'm not really showing that up here, but that's actually what's what is happening. And it, you know, in terms of uh, molecular orbital theory, you have a, a full sigma bond, sig sigma orbital, and a empty sigma star orbital. This is how it actually accomplishes the bond breaking. When they, these electrons go into the antibonding orbital of the chloride, guess what happens to the chloride? It breaks. The bond breaks and it goes away. Okay, that's basic molecular orbital theory of this reaction. So when we have this apparent attack from the back, and you know how we showed the tetrahedron kind of flipping from the, in chloromethane, how the, the tetrahedra, tetrahedron flipped from one side to the other, 
you can imagine that that's going to have an effect on the stereochemistry in SNT reactions. If you have stereochemistry, chloromethane did not have stereochemistry, so it's kind of a boring example. But let's show um, let's show an uh, example with stereochemistry. So if we show an SN2 reaction, uh, depending on the substrate, it can proceed with inversion of configuration. Okay, um, if you have chirality like on a secondary carbon, we, we actually see this. And so let's let's show an example on a secondary substrate. All right, so I am going to show this molecule. And if we do the, uh, I have to draw it this way, and I'm going to have the H in the plane like this for, for my example to work out really well. Maybe I'll draw the H a little bit longer. The bond to the H is a little bit longer. Okay, so if I uh, do an SN2 reaction, I'll, do, I'll use chloride for example. Um, we're going to see something kind of cool happen. All right. Uh, if I do the name of this, it's S2-bromobutane. Okay. S2-bromobutane. S2-bromobutane. Let's see. Is that right? Make sense? If that's uh, A, B, C, yeah. If I use my left hand, A, B, C, that's uh, S. S2-bromobutane. All right. All right. So. Um, and if I kind of draw how the SN2 reaction occurs, of course the chloride attacks, kicks off the BR. What does a transition state look like? And what does the product look like? So when, the pro when you have the product, now the chloride is on the left, and now we have C... There's the H. I'm not, here I'm not drawing the carbon as C. I'm just using the vertex right there. And then we have CH3, CH2, CH3. It's a little hard to see because my line, but yeah, there's a. It's a wedge to CH2, CH3. Wedge to CH2, CH3. All right. It's an ethyl group, right? It's a two carbon piece. CH2, CH3. All right, if we do the, I'll show the transition state in a second, but what's the, and, and then, but the name, what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be something, um, uh, chlorobutane. And let's, let's check the stereochemistry, actually. All right, so A, B, C, uh, right hand, fingers started the chlorine, wrap around to the ethyl, and all the way around to the methyl. That is right hand, that's R. R to chlorobutane. R to chlorobutane. Hmm, weird. How do we go from S to bromobutane to R to chlorobutane? It looks like, it makes sense, like we were talking about, how the nucleophile tax and kind of. Uh, inverts the stereochemistry. And, and what is the, what is the uh, intermediate transition state going to look like? Well now we have the C and the H up there and we have the methyl coming down and the wedged out CH2CH3. Okay, so the the methyl is kind of going away, the ethyl is coming towards us and then we have the dash 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 BR and the dash dash, dash, chlorine, delta negative, delta negative, right? Okay, so this is kind of cool. And, and it, with a secondary substrate with chirality, 
leaving group, you know, that's a chiral carbon, definitely. It's a, a, a chiral center. Um, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to, in, in, when I'm looking at this chloride, I don't want to make it seem like that's a wedge. That's just a, that's just a line. Okay. The only wedge is the, is the ethyl, CH2 and CH3, right? Okay. Um, but, yeah, it looks like as the nucleophile attacks, kicks off the bromide, the uh, tetrahedron flips, and, and, and that changes the stereochemistry from S to R, okay? Yeah, I like to consider this like an umbrella flip. I think the, I think the textbook may have a figure of that. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's going to start raining here in San Francisco pretty soon, and if you ever sat at the bus stop in the, in the windy rain, your umbrella is likely to flip. It's happened to me a thousand times, and it sucks. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of what... What it, this is kind of like an umbrella flip, how, how the umbrella goes from one side to the other through a kind of high energy intermediate, and then, and then now the umbrella is on the other side. Okay? All right. Um, another, another word for this, uh, we, we say the SN2 reaction is called stereospecific. So stereospecific is basically going to suggest that if you have like a starting material with one chirality and, and then nucleophile attacks, the stereochemistry of the product is completely flipped. It's not like a little bit is not flipped. It's not like you have a little bit. If you have pure S two bromobutane. And now you have you will have pure R two chlorobutane. You're not going to have a little bit of S two chlorobutane, because the chirality of the starting material will dictate the chirality of the product. That's what we mean, we mean by stereospecific. Uh, we could say that each molecule of SM starting material is converted to product with defined stereochem. Okay, so it's not like a little bit slips through and you get, a little, you know, if it's 100% S, makes 100% R. That's what we mean by stereospecific. So, example, if I have 100% S, 2-bromobutane, in a bottle, and I react it with SNT reaction with uh, chloride in this example, you will make 100% R to chlorobutane in your bottle. Okay? 100% in, 100% out, stereospecific. Uh, there's another word. Okay, so this is called stereospecific, right? Stereospecific. Another word uh, is called stereoselective. Stereoselective. This is so ver stereospecific versus stereoselective. And this, what stereoselective means is there's a preference but it's not complete. Okay, and so if we had 100% of S, stereoselective, and we will see stereoselective, for example, uh, the SN1 reaction will be a little bit stereoselective. If I have 100% S, it might give me like 80% R, or something like that, or, or you know, does that make sense? that the word stereoselective stereoselective means there's preference but not it's not a complete conversion like 100% S would maybe make 80% R and, and then the other like 20% is S so we'll get more into that later okay so we're still on number five which is talking about stereochemistry and let's just show a couple examples Example, uh, let's do a secondary substrate. We just showed a secondary substrate, two 
tuberomobutane, right? Let's just do another one. Like if I have iodide and I react it with Br minus what's the uh, and, and you know whether I put the Br minus in this case the nucleophile this is the nuke this is the substrate whether I put it over on the arrow or I put it on the left that's all irrelevant um, Uh, yeah, so what's what's going to happen? If, if this is a secondary, this, this is actually two chiral centers, but I'm only going to react with the one with the leaving group on it, because that's a, a leaving group that's that can be left or kicked off. The BR would attack and kick it off, and then you would get BR here. But what's the chirality of BR? Because as we just saw, on a secondary substrate, the chirality gets flopped from one side to the other. So the way to draw that is like this and then I minus is a leaving group. And as a simplified mechanism of this, how can I draw a simplified mechanism of this reaction? It's, it's pretty simple already so there's not, not, not much simplifying to do but I'm going to circle the BR and have it Attack from the back. Yeah. And that kind of shows how the BR attacks from the back. The back side of the carbon kicks off the iodide, and when it does that, the stereochemistry changes. Okay. What about a primary substrate? I didn't determine the R and S of these two, but uh, that carbon would, would flip. I think it's uh, looks like it's R. I think that's R on the iodine. That would be S on the iodine. Okay, but there's also the methyl. I'm not going to go through the naming of this all. Okay, all right. So um, what about a primary substrate? So. We'll talk about what makes a good nucleophile in a second. Right now, hydroxide is is okay. Uh, the halogens are okay. There's going to be some other good and bad nucleophiles. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's draw the mechanism and the product. And also in the mechanism, I'm not showing this the transition state. And it's actually kind of hard to show the transition state here. We show the transition state just to explain how the reaction works and you know why you get the inversion but it's not like every time you draw a mechanism you need to draw the transition state okay all right so yeah what's what what's the product what's the mechanism uh, well the mechanism is really easy this attacks from the back your minus is there stereochemistry here well, is that a chiral molecule? Is one bromopropane a chiral molecule? It's not a chiral molecule. So yes, the reaction occurs, there's just no stereochemistry changes. Secondary, you often have a, chir a chiral inversion. Not always with secondary, because some secondary aren't chiral. But if you do have a chiral secondary substrate, yes, you will always, in you always see this kind of inversion. Okay? What about a tertiary substrate? Okay, so that's a tertiary uh, chloride in his chiral. And would you see oops, inversion? To give the iodide, you know, chloride's going towards us, now iodide would be going away. Uh, 
Um, and then you'd have chloride displaced. Okay. That's the question. It, it, would you see that in a tertiary substrate? I mean, it looks kind of like, yeah, oh yeah, iodide attacks, kicks off the chloride, now you get an inverted uh, thing. Well, this is a trick question. Because what did we say about tertiary before? We said tertiary does not undergo SN2, and that's true. This does not ha This is not does not happen uh, via SN2. Not via SN2. There is something that happens via the thing called SN1, and uh, but that's next chapter. There's a little bit of complexity there. Okay. So yes, this kind of does happen. It's just not not through the SN2 reaction, and the, and the SN2 reaction is what would give you the the inversion. So. Let's just kind of uh, defer this one until the next chapter. All right. We'll say, and I'll also just say the stereochemical outcome. Will be more complicated. Because the mechanism is more complicated. The SN1. Uh, via SN1. The SN1 mechanism is a tad more complicated and so this example will be a tad more complicated. So for now let's just, it's safe to just assume, yeah, if you have tertiary, just don't think SN2, okay? Okay, so number six, I'm going to call fun examples of SN2 inversion. Okay, I'm not sure if everybody considers consider, it fun. I, I think SN2 reactions are kind of fun in principle. Um, let's show uh, R2-bromo-octane. R2-bromo-octane. R2 bromo octane, which is that structure? How many carbons is it? Octane should be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Um, R will have the BROA. Double check that. Uh, thumb method R. Yeah, right hand R. H coming towards us. And it's, uh, yeah, R. Okay. And the uh, optical rotation is negative 34.6 degrees. So it's is that D or L? Negative is uh, to the left, and left is levo L. So this is also L two bromo two bromo octane. Okay. Um, and let's just react this with H S minus. HS minus, which is a great nucleophile. We'll talk about nucleophile ability in a bit. HS minus, wonderful nucleophile. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that it, uh, it's, it's lower on the periodic table, which we, where, where did we give that? Lower on the periodic table? Polarizable. So this will be, we'll, we'll, we'll describe this as a polarizable nucleophile. And polarizable nucleophiles are always good nucleophiles. We'll talk about that a bit more later. All right, so what's the product? Um, so what's the mechanism? You can always draw the mechanism. You got a nucleophile. You got a, a organic molecule with a leaving group. Circle and pair. Kind of sneak around in there and attack from the back. Kick off the BR. What's the product now? And and the stereochemistry. So eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I drew too many. Whoops. Okay, now we have eight carbons. Now, uh, HS attack from the back. BR was going away. Now the SH or the yeah SH is coming towards us. So we have a wedge. The H was coming towards us. Now the H is going away. All right. So there's our our product. Uh, name of this is beyond your level. I'll just tell you though. It's S two octane thiol.
yeah, naming of thiols is a little weird. It's not 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 that crazy, but it's it's different than when you say two bromo octane. Now it's two octane thiol. Okay. All right, and the leaving group is Br minus. Leaving group's gone. It's left. Okay, and uh, the alpha is it? Is it the um, opposite? Is it just positive thirty four point six? Well, answer is no because we actually changed the structure. The only you know the what we could probably say is that if this is R two bromo two bromo octane and it's negative thirty four point six. If you had S two bromo octane, it would be the opposite. It, that would be thirty four point six. But here it's like the BR and the SH are different, so the alpha is different, and this actually goes to thirty six point four positive. Okay, uh, so the the digits are reorganized, but <laughs> these are clearly not enantiomers. These are different molecules completely. These aren't constitutional isomers either. Here we have the bromine. Here we have the sulfur. Okay. Okay, so that's not that crazy. That actually, not even that fun. It's kind of boring. But what if we want, what if we want R2 Bromo octane, and we want to make it into R. Octane thiol. How would you do that? Question mark, question mark, question mark. How would you possibly go from R to R? Seems impossible, right? If you have R and SN2 causes inversion, it would make S. So how how could you possibly accomplish R to R? And uh, there's a pretty cool way you can do it, and that's that is to basically we call it a double inversion. So you invert R to S, and you know with a different leaving group, and then S to R. So you go is a double inversion. You invert and you invert and you go from R to S to R. That's how we that's the way we do it. All right. So how would you, how would you accomplish that? You can do this. Okay. So now I'm going to just start again with R to bromo octane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just like before. Now we have R2 bromo octane. And we do this, but now we're not going to react with thiol. We're going to actually react with iodide. And the thing about iodide is that it is a good, it's a good leaving group and a good nucleophile. So, it loves to be a nucleophile, and it's also a good leaving group. So, when we go from R to bromo octane, and what's the optical rotation of it again? It's negative uh, 34.6. Negative 34.6. And we're going to react with iodide. And what's iodide going to do? SN2 reaction with inversion, right? So, mechanism, circle on pair, sneak in from the back, kick off the leaving group. And that will make, now iodide won't be going away, iodine will be coming towards us. I'm going to skip the hydrogen because you don't really need to draw the hydrogen every time. Okay, what's the name of that molecule? If this was R2 bromo octane, this must be something to iodo octane. And what's the stereochemistry going to be? Well, if this was R, this has got to be S. It has to be, you can double check it, it's absolutely S. And what's the alpha? Um, that's something you, you can't really know, but you'd look it up, or it's in the book, for example. The sign changed. It's uh, went from negative 34.6. The iodine uh, makes it 46.3, so it's a little bit larger in magnitude. All right. Okay. And now 
now we went from R to S, now we go back to R. S H minus. So here we go, there's our thiol thiolate, S H minus. And what's it gonna do? Circle and pair, attack, flip over. And now we went from R to S back to R. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now where's this where's the sulfur? Is it towards us or away? It's away. And I'm skipping the hydrogen on the carbon because you don't need it to draw it every time. Okay, and now that this molecule is called R two octane thiol. And the alpha value must be what must it be? That's two it's R two octane thiol. Okay. And what's the alpha value? That we can determine by looking elsewhere on the page. Because up top we, we went from R two bromo octane to S two bromo octane thiol. So R R two octane thiol will be the opposite. It'll be negative thirty six point four. Okay. Negative thirty six point four. Okay, cool. So that worked. Looking back at the overall page, I don't know if you can see it all. We we initially showed R go to S, and then the question was, how could we go from R to R, R two bromo to R two octane thiol? And the answer was, we do a double inversion. So we take R two bromo octane, do a single inversion to S two iodo octane, and then do a second inversion back to R two octane thiol, and that gives us negative thirty six point four the opposite of 36.4, which is the S one. That's pretty cool. All right. There's a name for this. Uh, double inversion, I just said that. Double inversion. And by double inversion, I, I kind of mean uh, another way to say that is net retention of configuration. Net retention of configuration. What does that mean? That means that I had basically 100% R, so it's like just an R, two bromo octane. It went completely to S and then back to R. And by retention of configuration, I'm trying to say that oh yeah, R gives R after the two-step process. And so if I if I just consider a single SN2 reaction. Like, if I consider it a normal SN2, a single SN2, we call it net inversion of configuration. Net inversion of configuration. So a, no, a single SN2 reaction is a net inversion. It's just like, like here, a sing, like if I just consider this step, R gives me S. That's a net inversion. But if I if I do it twice, then it's net retention because R ultimately would give me R. Okay, so single SN2 is called net inversion of configuration. Okay, I'm going to show another example of a. Uh, Inversion reaction. This time I'm going to use a Fisher projection, which we're, we're not experts at Fisher projections, but you can still, you should be able to understand it a bit. Overview, kind of what it means. But let's imagine BRH, HH, fluoride, and CH3. Okay. So that's a Fisher projection. Remember the meaning of this was that the horizontal things are kind of coming towards us. These things are, you know, these are going coming towards us from the left. These things are coming towards us from the right. Everything that's vertical is kind of uh, going away. 
this, uh, the actual appearance of this is kind of a, like arched. So it kind of arches over, but you don't really have to visualize it. Big thing is, is this chiral? The answer is yes. Those are chiral centers. It's got two chiral centers. The BR is coming towards us. The chloride is coming towards us. So is it chiral? The answer is yes. If I react to this with a good nucleophile like cyanide, uh, CN minus, uh, what's going to happen? It's going to attack both of the chiral centers, the BR one and the chlorine one, and it's going to it's going to invert, right? So N C H H H N C H H H C H three is this chiral. Um, well, now it looks like we have a plane of symmetry. Uh, sorry, let's get rid of th these ones. My bad. All right. Um, there we go. All right, so this was chiral. This is not chiral because now it looks like you have two chiral centers, but there's a plane of symmetry. The top mirrors the bottom, and so it's, what's the word of that for that? Two chiral centers, and a plane of symmetry. Uh, it's called meso. It's achiral and it's meso. Okay. And, and let's just kind of, we can visualize this. I, I can kind of interpret the Fisher projection to show the meaning of it. So you, you have like carbon, 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 CH3, CH3, H, 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 NC, H. Let's see, that's, that's kind of the interpretation of the Fisher projection. We're not doing a ton with Fisher projections in this course, but you should be, at least be able to visualize, you know, kind of what, what it looks like. That is the interpretation of this Fisher projection. Um, and yeah, you can now definitely see the plane of symmetry that slices through these two H's and the top mirrors the bottom. All right. So, yeah, it's miso. It's actually not, not, that's the wrong equal sign. It should be equal. They are equal. Okay. Let's show another one. Okay, is that a chiral molecule? That is a chiral molecule. Those are two chiral centers, no plane of symmetry, it's yes. What if I react to this with, this time I'm gonna scare you and I'm gonna write Na plus Cn minus, Na plus Cn minus, or you could just say NaCn. Because usually I have not been showing the counter ion, like the, I just would just say Cn minus, right? Well, of course, Cn minus does not exist. You need a uh, counter ion, and this is, this is a, you might call this, specta call this a spectator ion. It's not doing anything, it just kind of hangs around, and uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, this Cn minus attacks show the mechanism. What's the mechanism? Cn minus does what? It attacks the carbon and kicks off the BR. Okay. What's the stereochemistry now where the CN attacked? BR was away. Where's CN? Okay. So is this a chiral molecule? Is this a chiral molecule? That's the question. 
chiral or not. I mean, it looks like you got two chiral centers, but now it, it almost looks like like the top mirrors the bottom, and you might say, oh, well, that is uh, the top mirrors the bottom. It's not chiral. It's also miso. Okay, so just another example. Here we went from a chiral molecule to a, another molecule, and but it's a chiral and it's miso. Just for fun, we'll, we'll just convert. Uh, look at the alternate, an alternate version of this. This time I'll do casein. Potassium, sodium. Generally speaking, the, the metal doesn't affect the reactivity. And maybe I'll show the lone pair though, and you know, negative plus. Okay, what is the mechanism? What's the product? And is this chiral? Totally chiral. Yes, it's chiral. Is it chiral? It's yes. And now the potassium cyanide, the K, the K doesn't do anything. The CN does, though. The bottom CN doesn't do anything. It's still there. The new CN, though, well, that is wedged and coming towards us. Where's the new one going? Back. And what is the stereochemistry of that new molecule? Is it chiral or not? I mean, it's, that, that's stereochemistry, but is it chiral or not? Well, is it? Is there any, any reason it should be achiral? Those are. That's not a plane of symmetry. The top does not mirror the bottom, so this is definitely chiral. Yes. Okay. Okay, so moving on after this, uh, these couple of cool examples of chirality, we're we're gonna go through the different uh, aspects of the SN2 reaction, and we'll start now, and we'll continue next time. Um, so there's kind of three things we got to talk about, um, and those are going to be the leaving group. So, like, what makes a good leaving group? What makes a bad leaving group? You know, uh, we've seen a couple leaving groups. Right now, we know halogens are usually pretty good, but like fluoride, we'll learn is bad. Okay. Um, we'll also uh, talk about the nucleophile, and there's some good nucleophiles and some kind of bad nucleophiles. For the most part, you know, we we focus on the good ones, and but but we'll see that some of the nucleophiles are are bad. Things that are negatively charged are often good, but not always. Like CN is a good one. The halogens are good ones. We saw HS. HS minus is a good one. Uh, we'll, we'll have. Um, we'll see some more of those too. And then the substrate structure. So like uh, different kinds of uh, substrate. You know, like like well, we know that. Uh, for example, primary and uh, methyl and secondary are, are good substrates. Tertiary is bad. And there's a little bit of other uh, subtlety about the substrate structure. So we're going to basically systematically go through these different things. Right? So, first, we got to talk about the leaving group. Number seven, SN2 reactivity. Leaving group. Leaving group's a pretty easy one to start with. Um, it's, it's usually pretty straightforward. We'll say that leaving group ability 
is kind of equivalent to the stability of the leaving group when it falls off. Stability of a leaving group once it is kicked off. Right? If the leaving group is very unhappy and unstable, it's not going to want to be kicked off. It doesn't want to be a good leaving group, right? Okay, so you can kind of envision this, like if I have a nucleophile and I have a substrate with a leaving group and I have the nucleophile kick off the leaving group, what do I get? The product with the nucleophile attached and we get the leaving group negative and And if this thing is unstable, then that's going to be a problem, right? It, the best leaving groups are going to be a uh, nice, stable uh, species. That totally makes sense. So we can also say that the best leaving groups are good at stabilizing a negative charge. The best leaving groups are good at stabilizing a negative charge. And uh, some of those, some of the really good ones are I minus. Very, very stable. And it's partially because it's really large. It's a large ion and it can kind of distribute the negative charge over a pretty big space. Br minus, Cl minus, and F minus. F minus is the worst. This is a bad leaving group. And that's due to fluoride being very small with a concentrated charge density. So it's really tiny in the F, you know, you have a very small area for that negative charge is, and that's just generally kind of unstable. So F minus is not a stable thing. Okay. Um, let's mention a couple other good leaving groups. Other nice leaving groups. So you're going to see these kind of through the end of, or, well, through organic one and maybe through the end of organic two. They have funny names. So, let's see them. Now, in the real course, or the normal course, you would have to kind of memorize these and fortunately you don't have to do that in this course because everything's open note, but just, just write down these names and the structures. Okay, so all of these have uh, uh, a sulfur in them, so it's like oxygen, it's a S double bond O, double bond O, uh, CH3, this is one of them. And this whole thing is the leaving group. Uh, leaving, the whole uh, thing is a leaving group, and when we react it with a nucleophile, it attacks, kicks this whole thing off, and now the nucleophile is attached. What's the stereochemistry you now? If the nucleophile attacks, so SN2 reaction attacks from the back, now the nucleophile is in the back. Okay, and I'll give you the name in a second, but what's the structure of the leaving group? It's O minus S, double bond O, double bond O, CH3, that thing is very, very stable. There's a lot of uh, resonance stabilization, right? So the negative charge can resonate around, there's a lot of resonance stabilization. It's a very stable thing, stabilized by resonance. And things that are stable, when they get kicked off, are good leaving groups, right? So that's why that thing gets kicked off. Uh, this, let's give it a name. Uh, that big thing on top, and that is going to be called methane sulfonyl. Methane sulfonyl. 
or Measel. Measel, M-E-S-Y-L, and an abbreviation is M-S, M-S, okay? Methane sulfonyl or Measel or M-S. That does not include the oxygen. So let me, let's just, let's use the abbreviation MS and I'll just show another example. So if I have OMS, okay, secondary, achiral, there's no chirality here. And if I throw in a nucleophile, what's the product? So OMS is a leaving group, it just attacks Nuke file attacks, kick off that thing, and now you got nuke. OMS minus, which is the same as that. OMS minus is the same as the leaving group that we, we drew up here. OMS minus, that's OMS minus. So the MS refers to the S double bond O, double bond O, and the CH3, not that left most oxygen. Okay? Uh, I'm going to show just two more real quickly. They're, they're very similar, and they'll be done. Okay. So we have a couple more of these nice leaving groups, kind of like this. O, and then S double bond O, double bond O, and something. Okay. One of them is... is called, well it looks like this, very similar right? Oh and you have the S double bond O, double bond O, but instead of CH3 it's CF3, CF3, and it is a good leaving group, this whole thing, with the, with the, including the oxygen, is a good leaving group. It's got another funny name. And when I react this with a nucleophile, it just kicks it right off. And now we have O minus S double bond O, double bond O, CF3. Okay, so that's just an, another example of a good leaving group. And this one is called trifluoromethane sulfonyl, trifluoromethane sulfonyl, trifluoromethane sulfonyl, or triflate, triflate, T-R-I-F-L-A-T-E, triflate. What do you think a good abbreviation for that is? It's TF. Okay, so the first one we did, kind of funny one, was called mesyl or yeah, mesyl or methane sulfonyl, methane sulfonyl, mesyl or MS. This one is called trifluoromethane sulfonyl or triflate or TF. Okay, just another example of a sulfur-based leaving group that's really good. So if I I'll just for, and it's also the, uh, the, uh, that oxygen is not part of the abbreviation, so I say OTF, and that's, the, that whole thing is the leaving group, or the, yeah, the OTF is the leaving group. OTF minus, okay, very quickly I'll just draw one more, and then we'll, we'll be done. This one looks scary because there's a benzene, but it's really not scary. The, the benzene doesn't really have any significance, I guess. So this one, um, you have a methyl benzene, and the uh, I should mention what's the name of this molecule? 
Methyl benzene. Methyl benzene. It's called toluene. Because that's going to be part of this name. And this thing is called toluene sulfonyl. Toluene sulfonyl. And it's got a funny name called Tazel or, or TS. Alright, so it's a third one. There's only three we, we did. Measle, triflate, and tazel. And when a nucleophile attacks this, it just kicks it off too. It's another nice leaving group. Okay. And I'm just going to abbreviate that thing that falls off as TS. TS. That's the good leaving group. Okay. So the thing that falls off is a TS O minus, and that's the good leaving group. All right. Cool. So those are some a couple of these um, alternate leaving groups uh, to halogens. Those are the main ones. We, we did the halogens. You know, iodide, bromide, chloride. We did measle. We did trifluoromethane sulfonyl or triflate or TF, 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 it's a good leaving group. And we did uh, tazel. And tazel is just another one with S double bond O, double bond O, benzene, CH3. You don't have to memorize that structure. You will see it from time to time. Uh, let me Just very lastly, let's just do it as another abbreviated version. OTS. Oops. Nucleophile Okay, yes, so that's a nice abbreviation for that whole crazy thing. You will see them from time to time and I just wanted to mention them. All right, cool Alright, so we're done, and um, I think we're a little bit under time this time. Uh, I know we, we went over time a couple times, so I'll give you a couple extra minutes this time. We'll continue talking about leaving groups, and we'll talk about nucleophiles, we'll talk about the substrates. Those are not intended to be wedges or anything, I was just, my, my, my pen was dying. So, yeah, that's just a six member ring with a tosyl, tosylate leaving group. And yeah, we'll just keep going. Um, Alright.